It's starting at 11. <laughs> All right. So, Dirk, uh, you don't need to send them an email. Maybe you'll just come up and show those slides instead. Why don't we... Um, so, it's 11. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tom Anschutz, and um, uh, I'm part of, I guess I'm employed by AT&T. They sent me here, and I'm part of the telco, uh, telco project at OCP. Um, I've got a slide that for an agenda, and let me see if I can't show it to you. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my, my name is Archna Haylock. I'm the community director for OCP. I know that Tom has got an agenda specific for the telco workshop, which is why you're all here today. But if you have any questions about OCP, the organization, there's a number of us here. Um, we'll be towards the back of the room. We'll be here all day tomorrow. Myself, there is Dirk Van Slyke, our marketing director. There's Rajiv Sharma, our embedded software director. Our CTO, Bill uh, Carter. And then Michael Schill, I don't see him here, but um, he's also here. So there's a number of us. If you guys have any questions about OCP in general, please feel free to reach out after the workshop tonight. Um, what? I have a slide on it. Okay, so I'll let, turn it over to you or turn it over to you. Awesome. All right. <clears throat> thank you. Okay, thank you. And then let's see, we've got um, an agenda here. I just want to uh, put in front of f folks, so it's 11 o'clock, we're starting. Um, we're going to do a little bit more introduction about OCP and what's happening in the future, maybe it's the near future, and then we'll get into the program material for today. So as you can see, we're going to kick things off with Time and Sloan from the ONF and get an update on CORD, and then we're going to all break for lunch, and then we're going to go through PON. Uh, the PFP cabinet, then the XGS PON spec, and the GFAS spec. Now we're going to try to make this an actual workshop and not like a summit presentation kind of mode. So lots of interaction, back and forth, and, um, and you, things you want to learn or things that you'd like to make comments about, that's really what we're here for, right? The, the feedback we got from you folks in previous meetings was you don't want to have this present, you don't want to see me do this all afternoon, right? You want to have real conversations and turn this into a real workshop. Okay, after the G fast in the afternoon, we'll have a short break. Um, people like me need them. And then, um, and then we'll round out the day with uh, the cell site router uh, initiative. And then we'll get Bill Carter and Jeff Sharp to come up and talk about rack and open ops. So, a little about the bit about the TCO equations for carriers when they make use of OCP equipment. Okay, so and then as after Dirk is going to come up next and talk to you about some of the upcoming events for OCP, and then after that, we'll get prepared. We're going to do a round robin. Everybody will introduce themselves and um, and the company you work for. So, and with that, it's up, Dirk. All right, thank you. I just want to let you guys know about um, the next biggest events that we have coming up. We've got our first annual um, regional summit that's going to be held in Amsterdam, October 1st and 2nd. We've already started our call for participation. Um, it's going to end May 25th, so all the information can, be, can be found on our website, and then registration opens May 17th. We also have already started selling sponsorships and exhibit space. It's going to be a smaller version of our annual summit about a third of the size and so um, if you do want to you know exhibit or, or be a speaker or um, participate in that in any way you might want to get started on it um, feel free to ask me or any of the other OCP staff if you have any questions just wanted to remind you about our annual summit it's March 14th and 15th 2019 we're back at San Jose again and sponsor and exhibit sales have opened as well and we just thought we would get together this afternoon since, you know, Cord's here, Linux is here, uh, let's get everybody together. And so we're just going to go across the street at Cafe Blue. It's not an open bar, so it's cash bar, so you're on your own. We're foundations. We can't afford something like that. But we just thought it'd be a good idea to get everybody together. So 5 o'clock across the street, love to have everybody join us. That's it. Awesome. Thank you. And so the, this is the part you've all been waiting for. We'll start on your left, and um, why don't we weave back and forth on the tables. Please uh, stand up like this, introduce yourself, say, you know, I'm Tom Anschutz, I'm from AT&T. So, gentlemen in blue, why don't you start? <laughs> well, 
Thank you. Wow, that was pretty cool. We got a pretty broad, broad set of people from all kinds of companies. Um, all right, so the next um, item on the agenda is to get time and up here. And uh, we're going to, you know, we have all of these different opens going on. We're open compute, and there's an open networking, there's open Linux. And, well, Timon's going to help us with an update on the, um, from the ONF on the CORD project, which is pretty symbiotic with a lot of the things that we do here. And there we are. I love it when technology works. Okay, good morning, everyone. Um, so, very pleased to be here this morning. This is um, really kind of interesting. We have you know, a CORD workshop going on in parallel with the OCP workshop here today. And, um, and we have you know, a lot of synergies between the different groups. And uh, I'm pleased to be invited to speak over here. We're sort of cross-pollinating between the different communities. And I've been asked today to share what's going on with a CORD project, which is, um, you might think of it as a consumer from, from the OCP community. Um, and we consider OCP a very important, uh, almost like a feeder or upstream project from the CORD perspective. CORD is, is all about software, and I'll share today well, you know, what that is. But CORD's becoming a very important initiative, and, and it's really a set of projects um, in the carrier space, in the telco space. And um, so you know, hopefully this will be of interest to all of you. So I thought it might be important just to spend one slide on kind of level setting, you know, what the ONF is and how CORD fits in. Uh, there are a lot of moving parts. This is a space where every acronym begins with O, and it can be very hard to keep track of, of everything that's going on. And so, um, so hopefully this is, is helpful and useful for you. So number one, the first thing to know is, you know, our, our organization, our foundation is called the Open Networking Foundation. And it is somewhat unique in that it's a very specifically an operator-led um, organization and initiative. And you see here on the left, these are our board members uh, on the ONF. And, uh, and so it really drives things forward with a very operator-centric point of view. The ONF's been at it for a couple of years now and uh, you know, has been at the forefront of a number of different initiatives, um, some of which you may have heard of, some of which might be new to you today. But uh, you know, it really all started with SDN, or Software Defined Networking. This is work that came out of Stanford, but then was really uh, you know, moved and then championed within the ONF. And, and then you know, I, I view it as successive projects that each built on previous and prior work. And so you know, um, OpenFlow uh, was then work you know, based on SDN to be able to realize uh, you know, SDN. It was the protocol for separating the control plane and data plane. And then two open source projects that are notable, Onos and Cord. And uh, in, this is not inclusive of all the work at the ONF, but it's just some of the highlights. And now at this point in time, you know, the CORD project in particular is starting to get really notable traction worldwide. And these are just a couple of highlights from a couple of different analysts uh, to give you a sense of the, the scale of the impact and, um, and, and the breadth of the impact. Uh, just you know, one highlight here is that 40% of all subscribers are then you know, predicted to be running on CORD by 2021. That's mobile enterprise and uh, residential subscribers. So this is uh, an initiative that you know, we're seeing more than 20 tier one operators worldwide, very active in CORD um, and using it and, uh, and pushing it towards deployment. And we think at this point in time, it's uh, you know, a very important initiative. So I wanna pause here just so I can level set and, and kind of um, you know, serve you as best I can with a, just a couple of questions for the audience. So, so first of all, let me start at the basics. How many of you know of or are familiar with the ONF? That's pretty good. And so how about um, with CORD? How many are familiar with CORD? That's pretty good as well. It's amazing that every time I come out and speak, the number of hands you know, around CORD in particular goes up. I would say in this room, it was probably around 70 or 80%. So that's great. And I think that um, it's, it's terrific that this audience here and the OCP audience um, is, is becoming more and more familiar with this. And then maybe how many of you are active in CORD more than just knowing about it? So that's more like 5% or so. So maybe as a result of this, we'll get some more cross-pollination. You know, and you're all, it's open source, and you're invited to participate, of course. And I think there's a you know, really fantastic synergy. I, my personal belief is that CORD's going to be one of the greatest consumers of OCP and will suck through a lot of the work that both OCP and TIP is doing. I'll touch on that later in this presentation. But it's good that um, we're getting this cross-pollination going. So this is another slide that kind of level sets from the, from the 30,000 foot level. Like what is our strategy at the ONF? And I would say that this strategy is in many ways compatible with the OCP strategy, that 
you know, we, uh, maybe five plus years ago or so, we were faced with an industry that had a lot of vendor lock-in, that we had these large, vertically integrated, complex systems that were available from a smaller and smaller number of vendors over time, given the amount of consolidation that was taking place. And of what operators were finding, it was very hard to innovate in the networks, and networks were becoming much more expensive, and they were becoming uh, slower and more cumbersome to, to manage. And at the same time, operators are facing greater and greater competition from over-the-top players, Netflixes of the world, and the like. And so something had to change. And you know, the OCP initiative was started really to help kind of break some of this um, stranglehold on the industry and, and open things up. And the, uh, the Open Networking Foundation was founded to help drive this forward as well. The high-level way of thinking of our strategy here is that you know, the ONF, we view our we all take slightly different tacks on how to address the problem, and that's the beauty of open source and, and these multitude of communities. We all kind of uh, work together in a semi-chaotic chaotic way, but are, seem to be having a tremendous impact on the industry. So, but at the ONF, what we do is we work on platforms and, you know, and use open source as a vehicle, and that's where you know, the majority of our efforts are going at this point in time. We believe in disaggregation, white box, and open source as the tools to help move this industry forward at this point in time. With this, we're working on building a viable open source alternative for what used to be these, these um, you know, locked in boxes that you see here. But the problem we face, all of us as an industry, is that there's a lot of inertia in this industry that's been around for decades. If you look at any CO and you just look at the equipment that's in there that's been there 30 or 40 years old, or just the, the supply chains and the vendors and the complexity of these networks, it's not easy to drive change in such a large, complex industry with the amount of history it has. So to drive through the inertia problem at the ONF, our strategy is twofold. You know, well, one, it starts with the operators. And that means looking to the operators for vision and for funding to help push us forward. I mean, we're operator-led. We are a small foundation you know, of 30 people. There's no way we could be having the impact we're having. It's all about the operators. And we just work um, you know, at the behest of the operators. They drive the agenda. And we are just the catalyst that try to help pull and activate the community and, and drive this forward. The second piece is pull. But the pull comes from operators as well. But it comes in the form of customization and then deployment of these solutions. And as these operators move to deployment, this represents a multi-billion dollar opportunity for the vendors and the supply chain players that are in the room today or that are you know, a, a worldwide looking at this space. And this, uh, and this is then really what drives the industry forward. And we're going to talk, I'm going to take you through CORD today, but then I'm also going to touch on a, a, a broad initiative that our operators have kicked off uh, at the end of this, um, specifically around driving the industry forward and the supply chain forward at the end of my time today. Okay? So, you know, the other really important thing is that open source is not about free software. And I think this is a misconception that uh, many people are starting to understand the difference, but uh, I think it's really important to reiterate. I think this might be a core community that is maybe a little bit farther forward, but it's not about free software. It's about a community. It's about shared investment. It's about not, let, let's not each go off and try to build it ourselves. Let's build it in a shared way. That's really what the operators are asking for. That uh, rather than having every vendor go off and build their own box from scratch on up and have all that embedded R&D cost and complexity repeated again and again and again, let's build it in a common way. It's like think of you're building a car. Instead of everybody going off and building your own car, what if we all together build an engine together? Then you can all, we can all build our own chassis and paint it our own color and differentiate and compete in the market but we don't have to bear all that cost of building an engine. That's really what we're about here today. That's really what open source is about. So let's you know, step back. What's the problem space we're looking at now? So this, I mean, actually I credit Tom and we credit AT&T for guiding us in this direction early on that uh, you know, when the ONF started, and it really actually started looking at the core network and how do I big, build big core you know, packet optical networks. But, you know, that is not the core problem, the biggest problem that operators are facing today. So, you know, when we think of an operator's network, we think of the backbone. We think of a picture like this, and there might be 20 or 60 cities or, or whatnot. But this is a small fraction of the problem from an operator's perspective. Really, the problem is at the edge of the network. You know, the core of the network represents maybe 20% of the cost. 
both CapEx and OpEx. It's relatively simple to manage. It, uh, if you have to upgrade something, you have to get to 20 or 60 sites or so. You know, but if you have to do something at the edge of the network, we're talking about thousands of sites and buildings that often have no windows and no people, no lights, and you somehow have to get out there and, and, um, you know, and, and make an upgrade at the edge. We're talking about a, a tremendous amount of complexity, tremendous amount of cost, um, but this is really where the opportunity lies as well. So this is um, you know, a frame of mind the ONF started taking about three plus years ago, three, four and a half, you know, three and a half years ago. Um, it's really interesting for us to see that in the last six months or so, suddenly edge cloud and edge is like in every press piece and every analyst is talking about it. I think there's broad consensus now that the edge is where the problem is and more importantly, the opportunity is. But I do think that we were, you know, thanks to the operators, but really uh, guided here and, and working in this space, you know, really one of the first movers in this space, looking at this space. When we look at the edge, it really is a, a, a tremendous market in terms of scale and size. And for anybody here tracking the market or thinking about strategy and business, um, you know, the capex in the operator space is on the order of $350 billion a year. This is no small market at all, right? And 80% of it is at the edge, in the edge and axis of the network. And uh, you know, this represents a whole spectrum of things, but um, you know, CORD and the work we're doing is really impacting the, you know, the whole spectrum of activities out at the edge and access, and really impacting this entire $300 billion market. And, uh, and I'll mention that's $300 billion uh, in CapEx, you know, and uh, OpEx is generally considered to be even more uh, in terms of spend. I have seen OCP numbers at the last OCP summit, and um, you know, it, they were predicting, I don't remember the numbers, but they were uh, predicting that you know, the telco CapEx spend was going to uh, far exceed the, the cloud CapEx spend. It was uh, you know, growing fastest, you know, substantially smaller than cloud today, but in the next few years, it's going to be uh, overtaking the overall cloud spend. I think that this represents you know, one of the, the greatest transformations uh, in the network that we're going to see in our lifetime, I suspect, and one of the, the largest spends, if you're a, a marketing or business person, um, that, you know, and opportunities and inflections in an industry that we're going to see as well. So another notable thing is that this spend, which today is generally constructed by these embedded systems, is a combination of hardware and software. And, and locked together. The, what the split is, I think 50-50 is a reasonable assumption. You know, often you can't even see that split because the vendors bury it in their product and they just sell you a, a fixed system. You know? And uh, you know, I, I mentioned before that open source isn't about free software. The other thing is that carriers aren't expecting to spend less money. It's not like they're all saying, oh, our budgets are going to go way down, or that this curve that's growing slightly to the right that we see here is going to start going, dec decreasing. You know, the budgets are going to remain on the same kind of track, but they want to get much more efficient about how they spend their money, where they spend their money. They need to be able to be competitive in the current market. And so the way we view it is that that spend is going to continue to grow slightly, but it's going to shift in dynamic. The amount of money that's spent on hardware is going to go down some, not tremendously, but it's going to be able to go down some. Uh, but then the software piece sort of gets bifurcated, split, and, and distributed in a new way. That open source software isn't free. There's still some spend there. You're going to spend money on platform software and on vendors to support you. Remember, this doesn't include OpEx at all. You know. um, but then that, the rest of the spend is going to go towards software and services. And this is really where there's one of the greatest opportunities for the ecosystem and the supply chain. That there's, there's more money going after this new space. Uh, the space is being transformed dramatically and that operators want to make better and more efficient use of, of uh, their networks, but also be able to deploy new innovative and competitive services. And they have money to, to, uh, to spend, to apply in this space, because this shift is freeing up some, uh, some, some available spend in their budget to be able to apply it there. So I think this is, you know, yet again, one of the really exciting things about the, the trends we're seeing and the dynamic it's enabling. And I do think we're going to see quite a shift in the industry over the next few years uh, as the industry uh, starts to realign itself to, to meet this demand. So um, let's talk about the edge and the central office at touch. 
You know, the, so the central office is you know, the edge building of the carriers, and you know, the operators have many, many thousands of these worldwide. These buildings tend to be within a few miles of every customer worldwide. They're uh, positioned because of the uh, geographical reach of copper to their customers, so they're often they're within three-ish miles of, of every subscriber that's out there. And you know, these are an, an unbelievable asset for these operators today, that uh, they are the gateway to their subscribers. It's where they connect to the customers. And as we all know, it's your storefront or where you connect to the customers where you have you know, the greatest opportunity to, to make an impression or to capture or to retain a customer. And when we look at the, the big picture of the cloud, you know, everybody's been talking about cloud for a couple of years now, but you know, it really came from a public cloud perspective, an Amazon AWS perspective. Now the telcos have been creating their own clouds as well, and, uh, you know, and we see that. But today, these central offices remain these brick windowless buildings that are out at the edge of the network that still represent the majority of the spend in what these networks look like. And they still are the blocker in connecting to the customer. And so this is really, again, the problem space that Cord has focused on and spent a lot of time thinking about. The big picture is we want to change the, the edge to an edge cloud. We want to have all the dynamics, the capabilities, the flexibility of, the, of a core cloud or a public cloud, but at the very edge of the network. There are a number of really notable things about, about the notion of an edge cloud. Um, and the first is that edge processing is vital. And when I first started talking about this, I think this was a novel concept. Again, in the last six months, I see a number of press, you know, I mean, frequently, every week, I see multiple, multiple kinds of pieces now. So I think, um, you know, the, the industry is catching on and understand the, 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 uh, how vital the edge is, but what a fantastic and amazing opportunity this is for operators and ultimately for customers as well. Because, you know, the subscriber edge is where the experience is dictated and latency is becoming one of the biggest blockers and um, one of the most important factors for next generation applications. Things like autonomous vehicles, uh, things like uh, you know, even IoT, um, you know, anything that's going to try to do augmented reality needs to be very close to the subscriber. I describe it like this often, that you know, if I'm gonna have all of your names overlaid on my glasses and as I move my head around, if those names are gonna stay fixed on somebody as I move around, that's got to be very, you know, a lot of processing, very close to me physically. I can't be doing this off in the Amazon cloud somewhere. I need to be doing this with just in a few miles of where I am locally. It is probably not going to fit in my glasses themselves, all right? It's going to be in the edge cloud. And these are the applications that everybody's excited about. Now, there's a lot of momentum and a lot of investment going into this application space, but it needs to run in an edge cloud. We need an edge cloud. The edge cloud physically has to be close to every subscriber worldwide, ultimately. And this is, I think, both the biggest uh, challenge and the biggest opportunity in many ways that, that uh, we face as an industry. Edge processing is both similar and different. It has some unique characteristics, you know. So number one, the sum of the whole edge is much greater than the cloud that's deployed today. And again, everybody talks cloud, 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 and the size and scale of these Amazon data centers, and everybody's impressed. When you look at the edge, and you look at the problem that's emerging and the opportunity that's emerging, it far, far exceeds what the, even the core cloud looks like. And the edge processing requires a number of different things. So, you know, we've come to believe that the core cloud can be just pure, um, you know, compute, networking, and storage, all white box, simplified. Well, at the edge, you need to interface to the customer itself. That has historically been the number one need out at the edge. And so you have to be able to connect with broadband or connect with RAN and radio or whatever other technique is being used. You need to be able to do things in real time. So again, if we're doing that kind of real, um, augmented reality processing, we're talking about um, latency in milliseconds and, and just the nature and processing has to be really different. You need to be able to deal with roaming as I walk around and I move from cell site to cell site, I don't want my glasses to suddenly have to reboot. So, um, you know, that, that's a whole new and different problem as well. And things like, you know, machine learning and the like, we're imagining now a split world where certain things are going to happen at the edge where you infer and act and can respond in milliseconds, but then you rely on a core cloud that's doing a lot of deep processing or archiving and analytics and things like that. And, then how, and you know, what's the problem space going to look like? Uh, over time. 
Uh, we think there's a lot of research and thinking going in this space now. The exact answer hasn't emerged yet, but it's clear it's going to be some kind of um, you know, pairing of, of the two. So I do think that the, uh, you know, the industry is catching on. And so there are a couple of analysts that uh, just notably recently made a couple of quotes, and I thought I'd stick them in here as well. You know, things like the edge will eat the cloud. Uh, you know, this is starting to be widely recognized as, uh, you know, an area that is becoming really, really important. Or the second one, you know, the return of the edge and the end of cloud computing. I don't know if I'd call it the end of cloud computing, but, you know, I think there are a lot of similarities. When we had the mainframe and the PC, we kind of, you know, historically over the years, every decade, we have things go centralized, they go back to the edge, they go back to the centralized, they go back to the edge. And this is yet another one of those shifts, the pendulum swings. And uh, so we are in the midst of seeing the pendulum start to swing or people starting to recognize the extent to which that swing, um, you know, what that's going to look like. And it's going to be big I think, in terms of dollars, in terms of energy, in terms of investment. So, you know, we looked at this problem space a couple of years ago and came after it with um, a couple of, of key principles when we thought about it. So number one is we wanted to get the, the economies of a data center, you know, and that's built on, you know, a few commodity building blocks. You don't want specialized hardware for every different problem space. You know, some of these CEOs have 300 different types of equipment uh, baked into them. And we want to get that down to white box, server storage, compute, and then specialized access equipment where necessary. We want the agility of a cloud provider. You know, instead of deploying a new service, we don't want to need to roll out the 351st box to deploy a new service. We want to be able to deploy it immediately on the white box infrastructure that's out there at the edge of the network. Again, this is learning from the Amazons and the Googles of the world. And we need all of this in a very easy to consume platform so that the whole industry can adopt it and, and uh, get rolling pretty fast. So these were the principles we thought of when, when we were thinking about Cord and trying to address the problem. So we took the central office, we said, what would it look like if we applied the best of cloud, SDN, and NFV thinking in the space? And, and, um, and from here emerged Cord. And Cord is, of course, needs to run on hardware, and so it leverages uh, you know, networking spine leaf fabric, like a data center as we know and love, uh, white box hardware, plus specialized access gear. You see on the left here, specialized gear for PON and for mobile RAN access, and specialized gear on the right as well. I guess this is your right over here. That's uh, connected to the WAN and to the backbone of the network. But Cord is all about software. It's a whole software stack and a whole bunch of applications and VNFs that can run on top of that. And what Cord provides today is all the capabilities one needs to onboard and manage and run uh, you know, the three main subscriber types that we have, you know, mobile, residential, and, and enterprise subscribers. And Cord you know, consumes from a lot of upstream projects, things like OpenStack and OCP and all these other upstream projects, but is intended to kind of you know, package it all together in a distribution that can be easily consumed to address these different subscriber types at the edge of the network. So what does the you know, generic architecture for a, an edge platform need to look like? So we have the subscribers on one side and then the core background on the other side. Again, your side's over here. And uh, you know, to, so to connect to the subscribers, you need to have access for, for wireline subscribers and for wireless subscribers of different types. You want to connect to the backbone, of course. You want to have servers and compute, uh, you know, in general white box capabilities. We need a whole switching fabric. Um, we, uh, this box is big because I'm going to fill it in in a minute, and you'll see that uh, you know, we don't think of the switching fabric as simply just the raw connectivity between the servers. We actually do quite a bit more uh, with it than that. Uh, and then you know, a software stack to pull it all together, a bunch of different apps for services that we know of today and services that we don't know of yet. And then we need something to pull it all together. And of course, you know, it's zero touch is a hot topic today, but especially when you think about running at the edge in these unlit buildings, you know, the ability to deploy, manage, you know, heal these things, um, it can't require human intervention. So this is genetically, uh, generically speaking, you know, what we think of as you know, what's needed at the edge cloud, putting all the pieces together. I see a bunch of cameras. I'm gonna give you one second to take a photo. So then, so Cord, when addressing this space, um, you know, we try to address all of it. it we think it's a, a, co a cohesive solution is needed because it's a lot of moving parts to put together to actually solve this, this edge cloud problem. 
So, you know, Cord has uh, projects and capabilities to connect e Ethernet subscribers or PON subscribers or mobile subscribers of various types. It has uh, and relies on OCP hardware for servers. It has a bunch of projects actually on the WAN side to connect to the backbone of the network with, uh, you know, existing optical ways and we have some new projects as well I'll share with you around disaggregated optical. We have a whole bunch of work in the switching fabric. Yeah, so yes, it's a spine leaf fabric for connecting everything, but we, and we leverage OpenFlow today, but we're doing a bunch of work in a, with a project called P4. And let me pause. How many people know or heard, have heard of P4? About half, a little more than half. Good. Uh, again, white boxes here, not just in the, in the uh, server space, but in the networking space. Uh, you know, an SDN fabric and fabric apps to pull together the, the whole network that uh, not just connects everything, but actually can do um, subscriber level processing in the fabric as well. A whole software stack to give you a whole, you know, compute environment, both uh, with VMs and with containers and orchestration to pull it all together. Uh, a whole bunch of apps and Cord comes with a whole spectrum of apps for residential, mobile and enterprise. Uh, and then everything you need to tie it together yet again, you know, and so Cord again works with a number of different upstream projects like Mass, which is bare metal as a service to be able to identify boxes, lo uh, servers, load them and boot them and, and manage them and a whole bunch of other tools again to, to cohesively be able to tie all this together to be able to bring up an entire environment from scratch, you know, you wire it, you, you power up the first server, the head node, and it just starts learning about the rack figures out what's there what, and starts loading images and booting the whole thing and brings an entire cord pod up. And that's really, you know, that's, that's part of cord today. And that's certainly part of the vision of deploying this in a, in COs worldwide. All of this is built with merchant silicon, white box and open source. You know, again, those are our, our, the key principles upon which the ONF operates and our operators continue to help push us in that direction. Um, you know, we need that to be able to get the kind of agility we need out of the networks uh, and the, the uh, price performance we need out of the networks, but mo most importantly, the agility, the ability to deploy um, new services rapidly and be able to consume um, the sort of best of breed components as they become available from the supply chain. And, but then, of course, running on top of this is enabling differentiation from different customizations that run on top. So again, you know, open source is not about free software. It's not that operators expect to get all this for free and suddenly they have no, you know, they have no need to spend on anything. We think of it as an 80-20 problem that we want the 80% platform to be um, built by the community and be able to be consumed by the community. Um, even they, you know, the operators will spend some on that for supportable versions of that platform. But then there's the icing on the cake, the 20%. You know, the operators need to differentiate. They need to compete amongst themselves as well. Just like the car manufacturers want to have different looking cars and different performing cars, even if they share parts. And, uh, and so there's room here for the supply chain to be able to differentiate, to put closed source components that run on top of cord and on top of this environment and um, to be able to give operators what they need. What operators are asking for fundamentally is let's all stop spending all of our cycles on that 80% problem, on that you know, NFVI problem of just how to build infrastructure and build a platform, and let's spend our money in R&D on, the, on the, the icing on the cake, on the specialized differentiation. And that differentiation can be hardware or software based, you know, specialized RF, for instance, specialized optics. You know, you know, those are important areas where we need to continue to push the state of the art forward. But we don't have to keep reinventing Ethernet, you know. I mean, there's certain things that, um, you know, are just more tried and true in some ways. And let's just leverage where we have some commonality and, and, and move our R&D spend where it can um, really deliver some good and push the industry forward. So Cord, again, you know, running on top of this data center like architecture on the bottom, it's a whole sequence of, uh, of open source software, both platform software and then software for specific types of subscribers and markets. And the ONF has a, a whole sequence of projects inside if you open up the hood. And I'm not going to go into all of them in detail today, I wouldn't have time, but they just want you to know about them um, and know about all the different piece parts. 
So across the bottom, you know, there are a number of different projects that address the different access types and different networking components uh, to, to connect subscribers to the backbone and connect the whole data center together. Uh, you know, XRAN is, is for a split RAN, you know, next generation radio access. Um, and you know, it's, it's taking the intel the, the, a lot of the intelligence and the controller out of the radio itself and putting it in the cloud so that operators can control the distribution of spectrum and, and moving subscribers and whatnot, and that that's not buried inside vendor-specific um, you know, radio implementations. Volta, which is for um, you know, sort of open OLT, PON environments, um, is, is part of uh, you know, an ONF project. Stratum is a new project focused um, to a large degree on P4, but it goes beyond P4. It's a new project that's really um, defining the next generation of SDN. And um, uh, there's, there are other talks about that, uh, you know, and, or come find me if you want to know more about that. And ODTN is an open uh, disaggregated transport network project that we just announced, um, uh, I don't know, a week or two ago. So it's, uh, it might be new to you as a name. Uh, it's actually been up and running since um, sort of late last year, but we announced it now because it's going into lab trial with Telefonica this month and NTT next month. And it's about taking the optical network and doing just what we have did in the RAN and the PON and the Ethernet space. You disaggregate it. You break it into pieces. You enable white boxes. Uh, you move the intelligence into a, an SDN controller. And in so doing, you enable innovation, uh, and you start to um, you know, enable uh, choice for operators, and you get all the benefits that we've seen elsewhere in the network. So in some ways, that's been sort of the last great piece, and, uh, and now we're kind of um, in a very serious way going after pushing that forward. This all then runs on you know, data center and uh, sort of connectivity components. Uh, you know, XOS, Trellis, and Onos together are, you know, there's a, Onos is a controller, Trellis gives you a fabric, you know, it's finally fabric for uh, NFV. Uh, XOS is, a, is an, an edge controller for being able to thread the services together for subscribers. And then collections of VNFs and services for the different uh, subscriber types. And the best way to think of this is that sort of the middle pieces are cord platform components that are kind of the glue that help build, uh, you know, put it all together. And all of this together can be thought of as cord. Some of these pieces can be used separately. Some operators assemble them in slightly different ways. Uh, and I'm going to come back and, and talk about that later because one of the things we've heard from the industry is that operators were assembling things in different ways and vendors were confused about what's getting traction or what do they build or how do they, what do they leverage. And um, we weren't seeing clear critical mass between very specific ways of assembling solutions. And so the ONF, or really the operators that, um, that, that run, own, and house the ONF uh, have taken quite an a, um, aggressive strategic plan and announced it, that was about a month ago or so, uh, to uh, help drive the industry forward and, and provide clarity there. And I, um, I'm pretty sure I have slides on that at the end of this. So uh, let's put this in the context of OCP and other open source projects. You know, yet again, another question I get asked all the time. Uh, a lot of confusion here because there are a lot of moving parts and pieces. Uh, I have a lot of uh, sympathy and appreciation for people that try and track this space, just given how fast it moves. So the way uh, you know, we see it snapping together is that both OCP and TIP really are almost like a peripheral supply chain and upstream projects creating hardware components that uh, Cord can then consume. Cord, this whole selection of projects um, you know, can be used uh, to build edge cloud solutions. And then there are a couple of end-to-end or, um, -end orchestration um, options, and ONAP is getting um, you know, very significant traction there. And that you know, the way this would all plug together is that an operator would have you know, one copy of ONAP doing master sort of end-to-end -end orchestration and automation, that you'd have a copy of Cord you know, at the edge, many copies at the edge of the network, uh, and, and I'll point out here, too, that Cord, even though it has central office in the name, uh, you know, we're getting traction with cable operators, uh, so that's, they call it something else. They call it a head end. Um, but it may be more interestingly, uh, we're seeing that Cord can get packaged so small now, you know, I mean, in a rack like this, that it's likely to go way beyond the CO, into radio towers into SUVs or into drones and for disaster areas to be able to fly in mobile service into Puerto Rico or something like that. And, uh, and so, um, 
uh, it's really even more than the CO at this point in time as it's being viewed and, and where the momentum is. But this is the way it all connects together. We think we're very excited about this. We think that, uh, you know, the, sort of a cohesive end-to-end -end solution is starting to bubble up. The pieces are starting to snap together. Um, and the community is starting to recognize you know, the synergies between all the different projects. Uh, so we think this is great and, and really very productive for the industry. And a testament to the, the, the power of open source and community like this, I like to joke that it's uh, semi-controlled chaos. And it's like chaos theory that makes all this work because we have these parallel projects that are all kind of running and, and bouncing into each other. But, uh, you know, amazing things happen. And the speed with which Cord is, is pushing the industry forward, OCP as well, uh, is, is really a tremendous testament to this, this way of working. So then, you know, I mentioned earlier that we're getting tremendous traction with Cord. This is a sampling of uh, some of the projects we know about. Uh, to be frank, we learn about things all the time, so I'm sure this list is light on, on different activity. You know, it's open source. You can go download Cord uh, right now on your laptop, if you like, while you sit here. Uh, and, uh, and, and all of these operators, uh, you know, it's important to note that they're generally in the trial phase. You know, POX, lab trials, early field trials. You know, and it's um, you know, a lot of interest. This is a huge transformation for a big, relatively stagnant industry historically. Uh, it, you know, so it's not surprising it's taking a little bit of time. It's actually amazing it's moving as fast as it is. Uh, I will share with you that I learned from one of these operators of, of moving the first production subscribers onto their network yesterday. Uh, I know of others. You're going to hear of at least, I would say, two or three production announcements this year from operators. Um, you know, the operators, they tend to be slow about really talking about when they're really going into production and, and that, you know, that's a disruptive thing for them to say to the industry, but it, it's happening for sure. It's happening uh, at quite a pace with a lot of enthusiasm and excitement in the operator space. But, you know, we are, or at least the operators, we're feeling like we're just a touch stuck, like there's a ton of interest. We have all these piece parts, you know, we've, we've got these amazing trials going, but for the operators to get from a lab trial or a field trial to suddenly supporting, you know, um, 200 million subscribers is, is a jump. And uh, the operators need something. They need something, and it's called a supply chain. They're not going to do it themselves. They're not going to just download open source and go fire it up. And, you know, they don't have the, the, the staff for that historically. They have historically relied on a supply chain all the way from, you know, well, all the way from silicon to box vendors to system integrators. Historically, those were all came in one company. You know, they would go to one of these large incumbents, and the incumbent would build their own chips, build their own boxes, provide system integration, and sell you a solution. And the operators were really good at buying from one vendor, or maybe they'd have dual source in a region. But they relied on the, the supply chain being that one vendor to put it all together. What's missing today is that's complicated in this open source world. The operators want, need, and demand visibility into that full supply chain, they want to see all the piece parts, but still exactly how you put it all together in a supportable, deployable solution, the, you know, the, that the, uh, the answer on that is still forming right now. And I think it's really going to form over the next 12 months, and we're seeing a lot of exciting activity there. But this is a bit of a segue into this next piece. It's like, how do you get to deployments? And we had a fascinating board meeting uh, back in December, and our board meetings are really some of the most fascinating board meetings I've been part of because we really get these operators together really talking um, you know, quite transparently about what's going on in the industry, what they need of the supply chain, where they want to go. And, um, and then parts of our board meetings, we had an open meeting and we had a lot of vendor participation and the vendors were complaining that oh, we, we're, it's, not, it's confusing to us. at and is doing something different than Telefonica is doing and how do the, you know, it, we don't know where to invest. Um, and part of that might be an excuse of, of you know, they're not investing and and, uh, and the operators and we have been very hopeful that the incumbent vendors would step up, see this as a massive $300 billion opportunity and go after it, you know, but they have not uh, invested with enthusiasm there. I can understand the complexity. We still are hoping and wanting them to kind of step up in that way, but um, really the operator said, we can't wait around anymore. You know, we're, we're done kind of just hoping that the industry will respond. What do we do to really move things forward? So from there, the operators came up with a new, you know, set of uh, what's being called reference designs. 
and they're really intended to help create and craft a new supply chain. And so the result of that last December board meeting is that our operators worked together you know, quite intensely for a couple of months. Um, this was not a trivial undertaking by any means. Um, they were working internally in their own organizations to kind of build consensus and understanding of where they wanted to go. The, the, the fundamental question, if you will, is, you know, um, are we serious? Are we serious about deploying open source based solutions? You know, or is this just an experiment to, to disrupt the industry? And, uh, and at what pace are we going to proceed forward? What's this going to look like? And so, you know, the work really then started to um, gel. And if you think back, just to touch, to put it in context, is that, you know, all of this work, the ONF's work, the open source work, really started as a very exploratory initiative. You know, SDN was the enabler at the time. It was kind of a disruptor. Let's break pieces apart and trust that then we'll be able to innovate once we have separate components. It's not all built and locked together. And then disaggregation was really the first step. You know, breaking the you know, hardware from software is the uh, simplest form of disaggregation. Then we've entered a period of disruption, and I'd say we're still in this period uh, and maybe ending sort of nearing the end of this period. But, you know, here we have white box hardware, open source software, we have merchant silicon, and this has all been proven to work. I mean, there were a lot of naysayers at the beginning. Oh, you can't do that. Oh, you can't build a disaggregated network. Oh, RAN, you can't disaggregate RAN. That's going to break everything. You know, so at this point in time, though, we've proven that, um, you know, it works. And it's not just the technology that works, but our trials are working with like-minded suppliers, getting the right people in the room together moves mountains. The things I've seen this community do in three months just amaze me at times. You know, um, we did something for Mobile World Congress, putting eight different brand new innovations together with a community of 10 companies from concept to de demonstrating live network in three months and showing it all in Barcelona you know, pulling the equipment from around the world together. Unbelievable how fast it could move uh, and, and how much innovation can be driven um, from a, a community of like-minded people. But, you know, again, the problem that uh, we kind of were faced in December and really started thinking about is what's next. The conclusion was that operators are serious about deploying, that this isn't, you know, some lark. This is really going to happen. But the supply chain is not in place to deliver. The core problem is we have a supply chain problem today. The operators have this problem. So what are we going to do about it? So what the operators did is by unanimous agreement, all the operators you see here are number one, have agreed to create something called reference designs for the axis and edge of the network. These RDs or reference designs are going to include open source from not just the ONF, but from anywhere in the industry. They can include OCP for sure. But these are, you know, intended to then be gold standards or blueprints for how you put all the pieces together to solve a use case or to solve a problem for production deployment. And then the operators are going to procure, they're going to buy off of these reference designs, making a very clear indication to the industry that, you know, these operators, we're going to have a group of operators for every reference design. So maybe three operators here say, oh, I want reference design A. And they're going to then buy off of that reference design. They're going to deploy, take to production off of that reference design. There should be no ambiguity in the industry about which operator is buying and what they're going to buy. And if you're a supply chain player, you can you know, invest in this space knowing at least who some of the initial key customers will be and that there definitely will be money spent in this space. You still need to go win the business, but at least you know where to go and place your efforts. Operators themselves are going to commit significant additional resources to this process. So this is additive to what the ONF has been doing in the past. The operators are going to pull from their other groups from across their organizations, notably including the ops organization as well, to help drive this forward. And then the operators are committed to reconstituting a supply chain. They want a supply chain. They demand a supply chain that's aligned with this vision of white box, open source, and disaggregation. They don't want a supply chain that's uh, begrudgingly kind of coming, oh, okay, I'll use that white box. You know, we want a supply chain that is excited about this possibility. And, um, and we're just tired of having supply chain players who are just, you know, there to kind of watch what's going on. But then when they're asked to, to bid on something, they come back with completely proprietary solutions yet again. Or, it, you know, it has open source in there, but it's buried behind proprietary APIs. 
that's not considered acceptable. You know, we want the industry to uh, enthusiastically embrace this. And, and so the operators are, are very serious about this. We believe with this set of operators, we have critical mass to drive the industry forward. These are the leading operators worldwide. Uh, they have enough buying power to move this forward. They have a spectrum of opportunity here. Notice that it's not just telcos. Uh, we have the number one cable operator worldwide in terms of who drives technology forward. Uh, and Google as well, number one cloud, you know, and next generation kind of thinking also part of the mix here. All enthusiastically participating in uh, this process and consuming from this process. So this is a, 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 a pictorial way of putting it together um, as well. So you think of this bottom track a little bit as kind of what we were doing to date at the ONF, that we build these open source components or, or projects um, that can be, uh, they, could, they can be uh, hardware or software, that from these you build platforms, you put pieces together, and then they take it to solutions, trials, and towards deployment. What we're adding is this notion of a reference design. The, you know, again, this blueprint to how you put the pieces together. So instead of every operator doing it themselves, uh, for the industry to, to do it in a more cohesive way. Uh, you know, the reference designs are going to be driven by the operators that you see here, the ONF operator partners, plus like-minded suppliers. Uh, you know, the thinking here is this is a new process. Uh, we don't want this to be a multi-year process. We plan to have two or three reference designs out this year in, in, in deployable, purchasable uh, procurement mode. And, uh, and we, we can't uh, do it with 150 people in the room. We need to start with something that's uh, relatively cohesive and smaller. Um, so we're, we're doing it that way intentionally. Uh, you know, the reference designs assemble components from across the industry. And the exemplar platforms put a sample set of open source components together so that you can rapidly consume it in the industry. Does not mean it's the only way to put things together that the reference design will be, have some modularity and you can choose different components and, and put things together in, in, in slightly different ways. But, uh, you know, the power of open source is the speed and ease with which one consumes. And so the exemplar platform will have a bomb, will have all the pieces you need. If you wire it this way, you download this distribution, you press a button, go get a cup of coffee, you come back, it should be up and working. That's the, the view. And Cord has been working that way to a large degree today. And we're going to leverage that model and continue to, to espouse and push that model going forward. Operators are then going to consume on this. So reference designs are to be these gold standards for procurement. The, the vision and goal here is to optimize communication across the industry, between operators, with operators in the supply chain, and to minimize variance. Again, so that we can all put our, you know, the wood behind common arrows and in common investment and move the industry faster and, and forward more rapidly. And with this, to help the supply chain focus R&D on common platforms. That's the vision, hope, and goal. And the last thing to mention is that, uh, you know, the, the ONF piece here is an ONF process. It's for ONF members and ONF partners that are kind of putting the reference designs. The rest of this track here is all completely open, done all in Apache 2.0. We're trying to find a balance right now. You know, this is, um, you know, something we're putting together. But um, that, that's how we're proceeding at the moment. So these reference designs, there'll be a handful of them. You know, they, put, they pull from across the industry and assemble a set of components into something that can be easily uh, consumed and deployed. Um, and it can consume from a whole set of projects. This is not in, meant to be uh, you know, all-inclusive. It just connects to that other diagram I used earlier, where it can consume from OCP or TIP. It can consume from uh, the ONF projects. It can consume, for instance, from ONAP or from you know, OpenStack, for instance, you know, all over the place. Uh, it can also include closed source components both hardware and software, um, should they be justified and, and add value to the solution. And there are going to be a small handful of them. You know, the goal is, well, we actually have pretty good visibility now. They're listed now on the right here. Um, and so, you know, software-defined or SDN-enabled broadband access. So that's for residential access, but also for PON as a, um, an access technology to connect for mobile backhaul, for instance. Uh, a next generation SDN, that includes the Stratum project and, and more. Uh, the, uh, an NFV fabric for building uh, a, you know, a data center fabric that can host applications and also run applications in the fabric itself. SDN transport, I mentioned that new open disaggregated transport network project in the optical space. 
And then a number of uh, what are being called for, uh, for a lack of better term, trailblazing activities, an M cord for mobile and multi-access cord, only because mobile is just a little bit further out. All these others are, are you know, at, at uh, very close to going to production. Mobile, just because 5G is still kind of solidifying some, is going to take a slightly, um, a little bit longer, but is ultimately even the largest of the opportunities. Everybody believes that, you know, the 5G uh, deployments and spend is going to be tremendous, and, uh, and all of this activity is, is poised to feed that spend. Operators to procure based on these designs. <coughs> And then our partners are going to craft the RDs, but our members are going to have access to the RDs once they're released from our TLT. So to share a view, this is a, a slide that uh, has been a little bit purged, and, um, but this was from the board deliberations that took place from December and over that, that the, uh, the quarter that followed. Uh, again, to re really rethink what we want the supply chain to look like. You know, it historically had been just all OEMs, uh, who are building these big, uh, comprehensive, vertically integrated solutions. Now viewing it as the operators want visibility and really need you know, sort of five positions to play. Now think of it as a football team, you know. So starting at the bottom, it's chip vendors building silicon, then it's ODM vendors, and we view uh, ODMs as having a, an opportunity to, to do more now, to be able to step up and, um, and do more than just build a box that somebody else puts their name on. Um, they have, you know, more direct contact to the customer. Uh, platform software, VNF vendors, and then system integrators. And these are sort of, um, you know, different positions that can be played. It's possible a company can play more than one position, and it's possible there's sort of some hybrid roles. This is, a, you know, a work in progress, drilling to figure it out. But these are, um, you know, largely how we're seeing it. And we have a couple of, um, you know, of companies in the different positions, but we also don't want too many companies in any of the positions. Um, you know, we think there's a, a huge market, and this will grow over time, but we, this is, uh, you know, a process that we're kicking off. We want to keep it uh, relatively tight as we, um, as we launch it and get it moving. And, uh, and I did make note in here that we have three companies that are not yet disclosed but have joined um, just since we announced this uh, four or six weeks ago or so. So... Um, you know, the, the roster is starting to kind of become clear to the operators and how they put the pieces together. And, uh, you know, we're excited about that. And, uh, you know, the process is up and running and, and starting to, to move with quite a bit of um, urgency and momentum's building. And, uh, and it's very exciting to see this starting to take shape. So we believe this is, you know, foreshadowing a pivot in the industry. We think this is quite a unique moment in time in our industry. I've, I've been at it for a while. Um, I'm sure a number of you have uh, been at it with me for some, a period of time here. But at this point in time, there's no question. I don't hear any questions about, you know, is white, so, white box or open source happening? Just a matter of time and how. But nobody's like, ah, it's not going to happen at all at this point in time. And this new plan for the, of the operators is intended to accelerate this transformation. We think there's huge value for the supply chain. We think this is, you know, it's great that you're here. The, the fact that you're here and, and in, involved in these sessions today and all these open source uh, activities means that you're, uh, you know, aware of and starting to invest in and, and understand the potential here. Uh, I think that's the first step. Um, but by being involved, you get, you know, visibility, influence, access to what's going on. But it's through active participation. Again, good that you're here. You know, it's a, it's, uh, I like to say in this space, you need to roll your sleeves up to get value out of it. You don't just participate by watching or subscribing to an email list and just kind of watching what's going on. You can really get value by really starting to participate and involve yourself, you start to meet your peers, start to meet the customers. Um, you start to really understand how the pieces fit together. And it's moving fast. So this is not something that you can just observe from the outside and really stay on top of. You, know, you need to, you need to put, some, put some elbow grease in. We think with this new plan, there's a clear path to monetization, and we think that will be, you know, first to market opportunities for those who embrace early. And it's really a unique opportunity with this inflection point taking place right now to, in, you know, involve, invest yourself, invest your companies now, uh, and participate and help drive this transformation. So now is the time. You know, we're in the middle of operationalizing this whole plan, um, and this is a call to the supply chain that, you know, an exciting opportunity. Um, a huge market opportunity, you know, when things change, when there's disruption, that's the opportunity to get in, help reestablish yourself in a new way, take market share, and this is the time to be doing that.
So just in summary, you know, sort of flushing out the graphic, to be able to take it mainstream now in this third phase, it's really around these common reference designs. Procurement from operators is going to be based on these reference designs. And we think from this too, we're going to see an aligned supply chain that's uh, delivering what the operators need and giving the operators uh, the capabilities they need to be able to take this to market. And you are going to see things like RFPs this year and other things starting to come out. I already know of, of activity in that, in that direction as well. So thank you. Appreciate your time. How are we doing time All right, good, thanks. So any questions? Happy? Yeah, please. Mm -hmm. And possibly XOR versus ONAP, although we can do it in some groups and all out there. How do you uh, explain that, or what's your approach to that? Okay, I'll, I'll repeat the question just a touch, and then we have a microphone for other questions. But the, the question was really, you know, how do you follow the space, and what's the relationship between uh, ONF and Linux Foundation, and then between a number of different projects like um, ONOS and ODL and, and uh, ONAP and XOS? So good question, and it's a frequent question, and yet again, a, a source of confusion to the industry, I think, just, again, things move so fast. So, you know, the ONF has a very unique model in that it's purely operator-led, driving open source, you know, forward with a, you know, kind of a more of a curated set of projects it has focused on historically, where the LF has had kind of a more of an open, you know, door policy, any projects can come in, you know, the ONF, or the LF has competing controller projects in it now, it took on Contrail recently. Uh, competing, you know, use that in a light phrase. I mean, they, they have different use cases and applications. But at the same time, the LF has expertise in open source and uh, mind share and has been do at this for a long time now. And so we went after and have found a unique way to kind of get the best of both. So the, the, uh, the ONF uh, is a member of LF. We pay fees to the LF and we work with them. At, think of it as two levels. We, we sort of keep the ONF bubble because it has this unique operator led thing that is done and with great success. But we work with the LF strategically kind of above us on how projects align across the industry. We have, you know, frequent discussions and meetings and we talk a lot about stuff. Um, and then at the bottom, we use LF as a service, you know, for HR and accounting and all this boring stuff that, uh, you know, they have the infrastructure and facilities uh, for. But in sort of in the center, we, we maintain kind of the bubble of the ONF to some degree to be able to pursue its, its, its unique form of mission. So that's number one. Um, specifically on the projects, you know, we, I mean, a year ago, we got asked a lot about ODL versus ONOS, and that was like the controller wars of three years ago or so. I would say that's just behind us. I get asked that question very, very infrequently now. Um, you know, it's clear now that there are different use cases, and, um, and they have different specialty. ODL is pretty good at, uh, at brownfield and legacy equipment, and if you want to manage a Cisco router, you know, it's got the plugins you need. Uh, ONOS really came after it from a very pure disruptive, what if I were to start from scratch and, and look at the problem space in, in an SDN-centric way of working, uh, but also has unique capabilities for real-time control, for a nonstop operation, you know, and be able to go into a very small footprint and grow to a large footprint, and is starting to become, in some ways, it means getting used, for instance, for the XRAN controller, where you've split RAN, we have a, you know, a version well, an instance of Onos that can do real-time spectrum management and move, you know, move subscribers around between bands and between cell sites, all in real time. That's not something that ODL is made for. You know, not, not something that ONAP is made for. Being able to do real-time subscriber management uh, is something that, um, that both XOS and, uh, and Onos you know, have focused on and, and specialize in. So in that way, they, they fit together. And then uh, the last part of your question was around ONAP, and I think I, I did speak to you know, kind of how those are kind of settling into to different positions in the network as well. Um, and, and I think that's good for the industry. I think it's starting to, to all gel and, and fit together. Okay, any other questions? There's a question over here. Dirk, there's a mic over here. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, um, question about uh, incumbents. Um, one definition of disruption is dramatic changes in market share, right? And so if this works, if this all plays out 
as, as you wish. Uh, that's the inevitable consequence, is that the market share will be disrupted and incumbents will potentially lose or change their business model in response. I mean, but I didn't see many of the big incumbents on your list of partners, if mm -hmm. you like. Um, so what's the expectation in terms of the incumbents' reaction? Are they going to drag their heels and, and dig in and try and protect their market share and do the golfing trips and the backward compatibility play and the fear, uncertainty and doubt thing for the next five to ten years? Or are they going to get on board and become supportive and uh, you know, uh, help accelerate this, this change for, for good? At the end of the day, it's change for good but incumbents have got the most to lose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so all, all accurate sta <coughs> statements, and I'll speak pretty frankly. Um, and we've taken a position of being relatively frank about all this. So um, if you had looked at our partner list uh, a year ago, you would have seen all the incumbents on our partner list. And, uh, and we, uh, those partners have not stepped up. Those incumbents have not stepped up. And so we um, have made a pretty dramatic shift. We've, you know, we've said, okay, you know, I mean, would, you're still welcome to step up. I'd still love to see you step up, but you haven't, um, you know, kind of shown us that you're making that level of investment. And for good reason. You know, I was on the vendor side for years. I understand the complexity of the problem. It's, you know, that kind of transformation is not easy. It's called the, you know, the innovator's dilemma in trying to transform any kind of market or business. Tough problem. Uh, you know, I get that, but it's the reality. And, um, you know, our, our position is you can put your head in the sand or you can kind of face it uh, head on. And uh, it's likely that, um, you know, this is going to cause some disruption for the incumbents. Uh, it's possible that, you know, a small handful of the incumbents, you know, they certainly have the skills. They certainly have the relationships. You know, they have the capabilities uh, to drive through transformation. But it's going to, you know, it, it's, it, it does require um, kind of a retooling of the, the business. And, uh, you know, we're still very hopeful that some of these incumbents will kind of take the journey with us and come out the other side. Um, but we're not seeing it yet, really. You know, they, are t they tend to be taking the same initiatives and creating uh, vendor proprietary versions of, you know, we know of vendor proprietary versions of Cord that are, that are in the works and getting pitched. And, um, and yeah, that's kind of to be expected. It's, it's kind of the old playbook. So again, speaking very frankly, um, we'd been hopeful from the start. Uh, they were kind of working with us, but even while working with us, they were all part of that uh, December meeting, actually, you know, kind of really when we were talking quite frankly about where we're going. Um, but we're not seeing them do take the right actions. And so, um, again, you know, just in the last month, we said, okay, new suppliers. You know, who's, who are the right suppliers now? Just, just one follow-up there. Now, are they talking to different people in the carriers and getting a different sort of message back? Like, you know, hang in there, you know, it's too risky. You know, I, w what's driving them to dig in their heels and not get on board. They, they must believe that there's a, a business strategy that supports that, that reluctance. Well, so uh, let me speak from personal experience. I was a, a management consultant um, just before taking this role in the ONF. I basically looked at business transformation for large <laughs> incumbent vendors. Uh, and uh, with one of the large incumbents, I was looking at the whole uh, portfolio of IP and cloud products, right? And uh, this kind of transformation is not an easy thing to do, you know, from an incumbent perspective. It just, it, you know, it means jobs have to shift, skills have to shift. When you look at the top line revenue number, it's hard to, to chart a smooth path, right? You wind up with this, uh, and it's kind of scary, you know, and so it's very hard for, for large incumbents to take the, um, to, to pull the trigger. It's really the frank, the frank answer here. And it's hard to chart on a, on a you know, for a, uh, an MBA to chart a course that is, highly deterministic and smooth. And there's a lot of risk and uncertainty, and when you uh, project that forward-looking market, it's always relatively small. It's hard to say, oh, it's gonna be 20 billion the first year, because you, you can't scale. You can't even build the boxes fast enough. So it's, oh, it's gonna be you know, 20 million the first year, and they're like, oh, it's gonna kill our $20 billion business. What, you know, it, 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 it's disruptive. So uh, that's what's, you know, that's what, uh, you know, we understand what causes the difficulty. Uh, I have a lot of sympathy and empathy, uh, and I'm here to, to help too, you know, and I do think it's possible, but it's, it's, uh, there's an element of risk, but there's an ele element of inevitability here um, I feel certain about. And so, uh, you know, the, the sooner you, uh, you know, face it and, and go after it, the better. Any other questions?
Good. Yep, there's somebody in front here. Yep. How are we doing on time? Um, we're doing really wonderful on time. These people have already given you 17 extra minutes in, out of their lunch. Ah. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, please. Uh, mm -hmm. We mentioned something about moving the um, intelligence from the cloud to the edge right now. That paradigm shift, how is, how is being tackled right now? With, you know, how, how are you doing that compute and intelligence at the cloud right now? Is it because you... So the question is, is how are we moving the intelligence to the, to the edge? To the edge, yeah. Mm. And, you know, an intelligent edge, basically. Mm -hmm. you know, that's what you said. So... Um, well, let's see. So how, how are we moving the intelligence to the edge? So the, the way we're after it, instead of kind of a big bang, like let's just pick up the intelligence and shift it to the edge, is, is to apply the best of cloud-like thinking and processes to the edge to solve the existing edge problems. And the existing edge problems for the operators are how do I connect subscribers? How do I connect a mobile subscriber? How do I connect a residential subscriber? That's where my money is anyway. And I have these specialized, expensive, uh, complex boxes today. Uh, I need to deploy next generation technologies. I want to deploy XGS Pawn, but I don't want to buy a box the way I bought it in the past. Can I do it in a cloud-like way? And so that's what Cord does today. It gives you a platform that can, you can buy servers and networking and a minimal amount of specialized XGS Pawn optical equipment. You know, take the, you know, I don't want to buy something like this. I want to buy something like this that does the specialized stuff. And then uh, I want to buy general purpose for the rest of it. So Cord does that today. And then it makes it possible to connect these subscribers. Um, and that's the existing business and the existing revenue stream for these operators. Great. But then once you have that, suddenly you have a cloud platform. You have general purpose compute. You have networking and storage. You can start to deploy other apps. You can do all kinds of things. You know, where we are ultimately headed is the, the app store of the edge. You know, you buy apps on your iPhone today and uh, you're able to download from all kinds of third parties. Well, where we want to go is make it possible for third parties to deploy apps at the edge of the carrier network. If I have the, the latest and greatest augmented reality app, I want to be able to just go on and bid for space, and it goes, gets pushed automatically to AT&T and Verizon's and Deutsche Telekom's networks and gets you know, act, you know, presence at the edge, and I can just start delivering services dynamically. And given that we have you know, sort of a cloud-native platform with all the dynamic capabilities of an AWS, we, with, as Cord gets deployed, that infrastructure is getting deployed, and then it can be leveraged. And that's exactly the model that Amazon used, right? They built their own cloud for their own store, and then they oh, I could resell this. And so we're doing the same at the edge of the operator network. Okay. Um, so I have a question regarding uh, you know this idea of the cloud in in the central office I guess and I was wondering how many of the of the uh, of the operators today are intending to deploy multiple apps on a cloud or would they deploy multiple sets of clouds because somewhere in your in your description, it sounded like there would be multiple cores, maybe even in the same office that would run, you know, as opposed to there being one big infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. Do, do you have any, any understanding of that? Yeah, so, you know, the question is, are there multiple cords specialized? Because we have this notion of R cord and M cord and E cord. And uh, so it does uh, give one the impression that you'd have three different cords running in a central office. But it's rapidly just coming together because it is common shared infrastructure. Um, you noticed on my list of multi-access cord, that's really to be able to support everything on one cord together. Uh, but for the um, convenience and for speed, uh, you know, we've kind of done specialized, it's almost, think of it a little bit like branching to be able to then execute quickly on the different branches but then be able to remerge. We're already remerging. Cord today already when you download it, comes with all the capabilities for the different subscriber bases, but you do select a personality when you boot it. Um, you know, in the, I think it's the next version, if not just the one after, and that's every four months, it's basically going to be per subscriber, just identify who you are and, and bring you up in the personality that you like. So we're definitely headed towards one 
one access cloud, one edge cloud, not multiple edge clouds at every site. Okay. Hey, one more question. Yeah. Um, Simone, if, I mean, if you could ask the hardware community for um, a product or products or work effort, um, what would you ask for? And maybe speak yeah. on behalf of the cord community. What, what's missing from the hardware side? Yeah, so, you know, I think that, um, uh, yeah, I guess there are three areas that I would think about, you know, first. I mean, the first is um, in terms of uh, footprint and hardening. You know, if cord is not going to be central office necessarily, but it's really going to get pushed out to radio towers and be distributed, it's like how do you get to really tight, compact, um, lights out operation? Um, and make it very easy to deploy, make it very easy for technicians to be able to kind of put and package things together. So there's kind of a packaging and a footprint um, kind of thing and a hardening thing and, I mean, is air conditioning out there or not kind of thing, you know, so we, we get to, to those kinds of questions. And then, um, and then I do think there are areas, certainly in RF and optical, that, um, you know, the, the, um, the bar needs to continue to be pushed as rapidly as possible. You know, RF is still the most expensive thing that operators buy. It's the most, you know, it's the scarcest resource. And so how do I really efficiently manage um, RF? And, uh, you know, the, the broader industry really hasn't stepped up and addressed the split RAN marketplace, you know, to be able to really separate out um, the RAN controller from the, the, the RF component and allow the RAN controller to go into the cloud and be owned by the operator. And so I think that that's going to be represented in the, in the, um, the physical packaging to some degree as well for RF. So I think there are things to do there. And then I think on the optical side as well, you know, we're driving disaggregation. Um, historically, those are big clunky chassis still today with line cards for transponders and line cards for, you know, uh, WSSs and the like. And, uh, and I think that uh, that will also then kind of transform towards a white box, disaggregated component, best of breed kind of selection process. And so um, good things to be done there as well. Sure. Thanks for the presentation, uh, Tim. Um, one question which comes to mind is, uh, in this new supply chain, what is the view of operators when it comes to support expectations for these solutions which are deployed at the edge? Uh, the supply chain is changing, so can you comment on how the expectations are changing from the past when they were deploying a siloed uh, solution versus a solution which is disaggregated with multiple parties contributing to it, uh, it must do something to change the support model. So it would be good to know uh, how operators are thinking about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think in some ways that is the $64,000 question that uh, is not yet clear. Um, and you noticed in my supply chain chart where I had sort of those five positions, you know, a system integrator and platform software companies were on that list of five. So the view right now is that those capabilities, um, they used to come from one vendor who kind of did everything for you, that uh, we look at the problem space of, of integration and support and service as a pie, and it's going to get sliced up, and some pieces will go to different places. Exactly how, we don't know. You know could there still be a single vendor who provided it? Yes. Uh, but I think in all likelihood, it's going to get carved up a little bit. I think the ODMs will take a piece of it, and that might just be forward and reverse logistics for hardware kind of components. I think there's platform software pieces to kind of tie it together, and I think there, uh, certainly for some operators, is going to be um, some kind of unifying support element from somewhere. Um, there may be some other operators that choose to support on their own. Uh, I think maybe some of the early operators will support on their own, but I think the, the mainstream will, uh, will look to some kind of supply chain that can support them. So, you know, the early movers have hired their own engineers and have done what's necessary because the market hasn't supplied what they want, but they all are looking for, they keep asking for, they want their vendors to step up and, and they're, um, they're open to new vendors kind of stepping into that space as well. So, you know, it is, it is the right question, DJ, and it's going to be interesting. And I think that it's going to start to kind of, you know, I think some clarity will start to emerge over the next 12, 18 months. Okay, okay. I, think, I think they've finally gotten hungry. Tom. All right, good. So, <laughs> well, thanks for the extra time. <laughs> so another round. That was a great Q&A.